Amen. Tonight's title or theme is going to be Apostolic, a Simple Definition and Explanation. Apostolic, a Simple Definition and Explanation. I just kind of feel led to go into a core teaching that's not going to be exhaustive. It's not going to be, I mean, there's so much that we can go into, but a core thought that I believe the Lord's put into my spirit so that we will be better equipped to either define or to understand or to go back and to look at some of um, the fundamentals that we stand upon. Can somebody say amen? amen? This evening I'm praying according to Psalms 19 and 14 that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in His sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. That's my desire, my wish, that, that the meditation um, of my heart, the words that I speak today would be acceptable in his sight. I have a question for you, two questions. The first one is, do you have a good answer for what apostolic means? Do you have a good answer for what apostolic means? If you're a member here at, at Morningstar, if you worship with us, if you're a part of this household of faith. Our, the name of our church is Morning Star Apostolic Church. In case you didn't know it, we are apostolic. The church part is quite straightforward. It's the apostolic part that requires a little more finesse, uh, especially for those who are new to this. And maybe today's a primer for somebody who doesn't know much about what apostolic really means. I, I do get... Uh, when I tell people what type of church I go to, I do always get that question. For those who aren't uh, well studied or really into theology, they're, they're always asking, what does apostolic mean? Uh, the second question is, why do we classify our faith as apostolic? Why do we classify our faith as apostolic? So tonight I'd like to give you a definition and an explanation. So let me start by saying this. When the Lord calls you, He doesn't give you a denominational explanation first, okay? He doesn't say, hi, I'm the Lord from the sunshine denomination. I just want to shine a little light on your life. He doesn't give us a denomination when He first meets us. And by the way, if you don't know what denomination means, denomination defined is a group or branch of any religion. Again, when the Lord meets us first or initially, He doesn't speak to us from a place of a, a denominational background. But He simply reveals Himself to us and gives us an opportunity to respond by faith. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now, although He isn't initially concerned with denomination, many times He uses association. Everybody say association. association. Let me give you a biblical example of what I'm saying. Again, maybe he's not going to meet you with a denominational uh, introduction, but he will use association. In Exodus 3 and 6, when the Lord called Moses, he told him, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac, and the Lord would go on to tell him that just as he was with these great men, I am with them, I am going to be with you, Moses, as well. These patriarchs were references or examples of God's relationship with them or of God's protection or of his faithfulness or of God's strength or of God's promise and of God's mercy. So when... God came to Moses. He said, listen, I've already been with these men. And what I've done through them, I'm going to do through you as well. And this is many times how the Lord finds us. It's not, again, through this conglomerate. It's not through this big denomination. When he meets us, he meets us right where we're at. He called upon his family. He called upon the patriarchs. And he said, just the same way that I've been with them, I'm going to be with you. Uh, that, that should give us reason to celebrate in this last day because God will meet you where you are at. He'll build up your faith. 
He'll teach you strong doctrine, sound doctrine. He'll bless your life. And, and when he meets us, he meets us, and he gives us exactly the information that we need to make it, to, to make the proper decisions. Can somebody say amen? amen? So the initial priority then would be association above denomination. Association above denomination or association will lead you to the proper denomination. Again, when I say association, I'm talking about those who, who the Lord used to help Moses. He said, listen, I've been with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I've been with, with, with them. I've been with your father. So to give you confidence that as I call you to do what you're going to do, look to their life and look to see what I've done with them, and that should give you confidence. This is association. And many times this is where the Lord finds us. This is where he helps us. Uh, for me, my testimony is I was pretty much born into this. Uh, I was baptized, received the gift of the Holy Ghost at a very young age. But as I matured, I would have to follow for myself the God of my father. Now, you may, you may say, the God of your father. Let me explain this. The reason I say that is because I saw with my own eyes what the Lord had done for my immediate family. I've seen it. I've been a witness of it. And in how the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and my parents revealed himself to me. Okay? When I turned 15, this was a turning point in my life, Jesus gave me an opportunity in my maturity to give my life back to him, just as he laid down his life for me over 2,000 years ago. So, again, we're talking about association. We're building up to the point of denomination. But, you see, God will take a rank sinner, one who is living far from truth or, or any form of decency, and he will turn their life around, away from substance addiction, away from pride that is driving them to an early grave and to an eventual hell, and he will sober them up, he'll wash their dark sins white as snow, and he will fill them with his spirit, causing them to walk a different walk and talk a different walk. Can somebody say, thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. This is my God. This is how wonderful our God is. So, the individual, which is family or not, who is converted by the power of the Holy Ghost has the greatest impact on a future believer. Somebody whose life has been transformed by the wonder-working power of God has the greatest impact on a potential sojourner or somebody who is desiring more of God. So, that being said, my encouragement to the young and to the old gathered here today is keep believing Keep expecting, keep praising, keep worshiping, keep meditating, keep clapping, keep shouting, keep reading in the Lord. As the scripture in Matthew 5 and 12 tells us, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven as you make a difference in somebody's life down here. For those of you who are saved, those of you who are sanctified, who are blood washed, who God has blessed your life, let me tell you, I encourage you to continue to be on fire for the Lord. Continue to be in a state of revival because your worship lifestyle and your faith in God is going to encourage somebody else on the job site, at school, or at play, or wherever you may find yourself, as you are filled with the Holy Ghost, as you are walking in proper doctrine, as you have authority over evil spirits, and you can discern things that are coming your way a mile away because the Lord has taught you and blessed you according to the Word of God, I tell you and encourage you, keep fighting, keep serving, keep worshiping, keep doing what God has expected you to do because you are going to help somebody who needs to know more about Jesus. The best testimony is a lifestyle of holiness, a lifestyle of righteousness that God has afforded to us uh, according to his grace. Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. 
As you acknowledge him in all your ways, according to Proverbs 3 and 6, and he directs your paths, it will encourage a weary sojourner that, is, that there is only one way to live. He is that way. He is that truth. He is that light, according to John 14 and 16. Let, let your testimony change somebody's mind. Let your testimony encourage somebody. I saw a bishop, an elect lady, serve the Lord through all kinds of crazy seasons, tests, and trials. But it was their faith that did encourage me. I wanted to serve the God that they were serving. Because they believed in the book wholeheartedly and outside of feelings, outside of what people could have done against them or how people could have built them up or dropped them or whatever it was, they had a faith in God that encouraged me. They raised their family according to the standards of the Word of God. So when I became of age, I, I wanted to be like mom and dad because our house wasn't a house of, of um, addiction. It wasn't a house of hatred. It wasn't a house of, of unbelief or fear or worry or anxiety. It was a house that was focused on serving God. We knew church more than anything. No wonder that, that Caleb and I became involved in the church the way we have because this has been our entire life. This is what we know more than anything else, to serve God and to serve his people. And I'm here to encourage somebody, let your convictions be strong. Let, let, let your testimony uh, uh, be wonderful. Let, let the backdrop of your life when, when you were in sin, let, let, that, that, let that be something that people look and realize, man, this person used to be that. They used to be bound. They, they used to be, you know, su such a, a, so bound by the things of this world. But today, they're clothed. They're in their right mind. They're worshiping the Lord. They're productive in society. They're doing the work of their father. I encourage you, continue to have the faith that this dark world needs. Amen? So before we look into denomination, the question is, can we see transformation? Before we look into de denomination, can we see transformation? Can you see Jesus in the one who is testifying to you? Or maybe we should flip that. Can people see Jesus in us as we testify of him? Is there good fruit in their lives? Is there evidence of the nature of God in their lifestyle? I think greater than any passage that you can initially give somebody, your lifestyle is going to speak louder than anything that you may say. When your family's in order, when you are working towards uh, accomplishing the word of God in your life and people see that, they see that desire in your life. When there's a faithfulness in your, in your life to serve God and, and to do the will of your father, People see that and they desire that. They, they see the good fruit that is in your life. They, they see the fact that, and this is not like a, a, a concern to be overtly perfect, but this is, this is a, a, an encouragement that when we serve the Lord and we're desiring to do what's right, that's all the world needs to see. You know, you could have a bad day, but the next day you show up to work and say, listen, you know what, yesterday my attitude wasn't the best. Hey, hey, hey I, I, I'm sorry for the attitude yesterday, but today's going to be a better day. That's victory. You know, um, people see that because people today don't know how, how to apologize. They don't know how to uh, confess they don't know things that we have learned in the house of God that God has given us. So let your light shine. And as it's shining, I know that God is going to bless you and that God is going to allow you to be uh, evangelistic and, and he's going to allow you to win people to the Lord simply by serving the Lord and letting your light shine. Can somebody say amen? So stating your denomination simply is letting the world know what kind of church you are a part of of. So, those of you who don't know, we are apostolic in doctrine. We are Pentecostal in experience. Apostolic in doctrine, Pentecostal in experience. So, apostolic defined in its probably simplest state 
is those who adhere to the teachings of the 12 apostles, and I do have notes for this, who followed Christ Jesus. Amen. Those who adhere to the teaching of the 12 apostles who followed Christ Jesus. Amen. So as we look into this, so when, you, when someone asks you what you are, you say, I'm apostolic because of the apostles who followed Jesus. It's really that simple. That's, that's, that's who we are. Now, there's a lot to it, but the core of it is what I want to talk to you about this evening. As Jesus appointed and anointed the twelve to preach and to teach his gospel, he gave special place or authority to the apostle Peter. He would have the keys of the kingdom. The words he would deliver would carry a great weight. So after Christ rose up from the grave and before he ascended back into heaven... He told them to wait for the promise of the Father in Jerusalem. As the apostles and others waited and prayed in the upper room in the place where Jesus told them to wait and pray, the Bible tells us in Acts 2 and 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So, an apostolic church believes that the same experience that the 120 received there on the day of Pentecost is available for every believer in Christ Jesus. Other denominations, other doctrines will tell you this was only exclusively for them. But we don't need to even look into it. I'm excited that there's a historical account of the birth of the church, that when the church was born, it was triumphant, it was supernatural, it was wonderful, it, it, it was glorious, because the Lord came back into them, and he demonstrated by mighty signs and wonders. This is the part of, uh, this is what we are associated with. This is the part of, uh, of the church that we are a part of. So our expectation is, guess what? The way they received the Holy Ghost, we can receive it too. The way God breathed into them, he could breathe into us. And the most exciting part of that is many of you, your life stories have been a wreck up to the point of, of church. You, you, your life was, I mean, you can write books on, on the craziness that was around your life. But when God gave you his spirit, my God, Something happened to you. He turned that crazy into sobriety and sanity and balance. And he taught you how to walk and he taught you how to live. And he taught you how to survive uh, uh, according to the spirit and, and to be blessed. All because we believed that we could receive the Holy Ghost the way they did on that day. We believe and we tell you, guess what? You can receive God's spirit inside of you. He could live in you, and we have scriptures to explain that. And instead of just saying, you know, um, I, I mean, I think the best way to, to talk about it is to tell people, guess what? You can and you will receive it. Yes. Ask for it. Seek after it because God wants to fill you. And the beautiful thing is once he fills us, he continues to, to live in us. And as long as we stir up the gift of God, stir up that Holy Ghost that is inside of us, uh, uh, we're going to hold on to that oil until he comes back. Amen. Can somebody give him a clap offering, thanking him for his goodness? <laughs> so... Here in Acts 2, the Bible tells us that the crowd outside heard all of this commotion. And the Bible tells us that they assumed that they were drinking because there was just too much partying and too much stuff going on. And they asked, what does this mean? And it's so beautiful. If you look at the passage, the Bible says that the 12 were standing there together. Again, we're talking about apostolic. We're talking about the apostles. The Bible says the 12 were standing there united. 
fresh uh, with the infilling of the Holy Ghost. But yet Peter, the one with the keys, answers the, uh, the concerns of the crowd. And he begins to explain how all these people heard God being glorified in their tongue by these locals. Peter begins to preach Jesus to them. Apostolic is one that we, everything we do is Jesus. We baptize in the name of Jesus. We lay hands on the sick in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. Everything we do is in the name of Jesus. That is apostolic. And that does distinguish us from other denominations and beliefs because we believe that that's a saving name. We believe that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and are saved. Somebody lift up the name. The name that has saved you from hell. The name that has blessed your soul. The name that has delivered you. Jesus. Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. I remember when I had my major uh, health situation, the heat stroke, and I was coming in and out of consciousness, and I, w I think I was dying, but my wife was there, and, and, and as I was going through all that initially, she just began, began to call in the name of Jesus and pray in the name of Jesus over me. And I tell you what, I believe because of the name of Jesus, I'm standing here today alive, <laughs> blessed, because of his goodness and because of my wife who knows that precious name. Amen. Acts 2 and 30 says, after the, P, uh, the apostle Peter begins to preach Jesus, and he, and he goes from the prophetic and he brings it to the present. He tells them uh, what happened to Jesus. And Acts 2 and 37, after they said, uh, what, after the crowd says, what does this mean? Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This was his response. He had the keys. Although the first church was Jewish, later on the Gentiles, the non-Jews like you and me, were given the same exact opportunity that those in the upper room experience. So when we preach uh, uh, to people Jesus and they ask, what should, uh, what should we do about it? We simply tell them what the Apostle Peter said in Acts 2. We tell people, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will be filled with the Holy Ghost. That is the gospel. That is the good news. We are all here presently, those of you who, who walk with the Lord can attest to the fact that if you repent, if you're baptized in, in his name, you will be filled with the Holy Ghost. You will be blessed. You will live a different, a unique, a life that God gives you authority and power. Why? Because you are apostolic according to the commandments that Jesus gave the apostles. And we're living in a day where so many church is, churches are doctrinally ambiguous and, and mysterious about what their belief system is. They don't want to associate with Pentecostalism or apostolic or uh, today, I mean, it, the world is getting crazy. The church world is insane. But I'm so glad that even though we are independent from an, an organization, and I thank God for every organization that has blessed our lives and helped us, but we are independent of, of every organization. I'm so thankful that Bishop has held on to the apostolic doctrine and the apostolic way. He has taught me. The church has been taught. And I'm here to tell you, we have apostolic expectation here. We believe in signs, wonders. We believe in miracles. We believe that God can raise the dead, that he can heal the sick, that he can save the lost soul. That, that's what apostolic is. It, it's, it's a believer that is in action, that is ready to do whatever God puts on our heart according to the word of God. I'm so thankful that the Lord has allowed us to walk in the apostolic way. Why don't we give the Lord a clap offering thanking him for his goodness. So this is the core belief of the apostolic church. When many others simply say a sinner 
uh, sinner's prayer is all it takes. An apostolic response is, we are all born into sin, and as we pray, we will confess our sins before a holy God and expect Him to fill us with His Spirit. We, we believe that there is more. The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and of the twelve apostles has appeared unto us, and His name is Jesus. Allowing us to be born again of the water and of the Spirit. Don't ever be ashamed of being apostolic, and don't forget that you have power from on high through the Holy Ghost because of how you have been obedient to the Word of God. I'm going to ask that we would all turn to Hebrews 6 and 1. The Scripture reads, again, Hebrews 6 and 1 and verse 2, Therefore, the leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ... Actually, I'll wait for you to, some of you to find your place. Again, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. As this passage is talking about perfection, it's talking about the church growing or becoming more mature. It does detail what we would call the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Okay. This would be, now, now what it's saying is there, are, there is a foundation to the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And it speaks in, uh, of seven basic divisions. It talks about faith in God. It talks about repentance in this passage. It talks about baptisms, which is referring to water and fire baptism. It's also talking about the laying on of hands or, or impartation and the resurrection from the dead and of eternal judgment. Now, uh, these are apostolic fundamentals right here. And the main focus of what we believe uh, is on God through Christ Jesus, okay? Him alone we worship. He is the one true God. Can somebody say amen? amen. As, but, not, but listen, and we do have notes for this. As we have a personal faith in him, this one true God, there must be a public lifestyle of worship that is practiced. I'm going to say that again. As we have a personal faith in him, we have faith in God, we must have a public lifestyle of worship that is practice. And it is organized by his church in the earth. So when we have our first encounter with the Lord, of, yes, it's, it's intimate, it's private between God and, and ourselves, but then once he imparts his spirit, once he gives us uh, uh, the commission or a calling or he places a particular burden on us, now we, we must mature, we must be perfected, we must develop, and that only happens with the local assembly or the church of the living God. Hebrews 10 and 25 tells us about the church. And before we find that place, I'm just going to tell you this. Just take this mental note. I'm here to tell you, you can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. And I'm going to show you why. Hebrews 10 and 25 tells us, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So, preaching, teaching, baptizing, imparting, laying on of the hands, and fellowship is not done without the church. It's not done without the church. You can't baptize yourself. When you're, when, when, when you're walking in darkness, you can't preach to yourself. You can't do it on your own. And that's why there must be a local church that are following the principles of the doctrine of Christ. That's why there must be preachers and teachers, and there must be a church that is saying, listen, come, come, come fellowship with us, come hang out with us, because we, we want to share Jesus with you. 
We're so thankful for the local assembly. We're so thankful for the church. Romans 10 and 13 tells us, as we're going to read down to the 15th verse, Romans 10, 13 through verse 15, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, salvation requires a calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. This is a personal thing. You must call on Jesus for yourself. Many of you were drunk, uh, intoxicated, uh, bound by certain addictions, drugs, immorality, but you had to call on Jesus all for yourself. Just because your wife was praying for you or mama or daddy was praying for you, uh, that was helping you get there, but you had to make a decision on your own. You, you had to call upon the name of the Lord. Jesus, I need your help. Jesus, I need freedom. Jesus, I need, I, I need your, your peace. Verse 14 tells us, as, as we go from the personal place, now we go into where the preacher comes in, and it says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So calling on him, it does require faith. It does require a belief. And they must hear of him to call or believe in him. They, they, they must hear him to, to believe in him. They, somebody needs to tell them. They will hear and call on him only after a preacher delivers the good news or the gospel. In other words, you need a preacher to tell you what the good book says. You need a preacher who is sent, a preacher who is called. This is what a church is built upon. A church is built upon a preacher that is giving you the word of God. And can I tell you, not just giving you the word of God, not, not just giving you theology, but a, a preacher, a pastor who is living what they believe. A, a, a preacher who, who tells their family, we're going to go to church, we're going to worship, we're, we're going to believe, we're, we're, we're going to act in this manner. And that's what, that's, that's what, it makes such a difference. There are so many so-called preachers. There are so many uh, uh, pastors that are self-appointed or, or, or that, are, that are talented, that are charismatic, that are gifted, but they may not be sent and when they build a congregation, you know, with a financial motivation or just for platform sake or to build a large group of number of people, you're going to see in time where that foundation is just going to fall apart. But I'm thankful for 40 years that God has given Bishop, Elect Lady, Morning Star Apostolic Church, because that was never the motivation. And God has kept us for almost, or over four decades. And I'm here to tell you, preaching, sound doctrine, it, it, it's, it's where it's at. You know, you, you, you can go through all the different phases. I remember people try to uh, talk to Bishop or myself, and they try to get us in their pyramid schemes or business schemes, and people who never would talk to us, you know, neighboring ministers, I'll just say, all of a sudden they felt anointed to talk to us about these schemes that they wanted to, you know, slip into Morningstar with, and Bishop's like, nope, no thank you. I'm here to, I'm here to preach the gospel. We don't need no tables overturned over here in, in our foyer. The focus is we're apostolic, we want the Holy Ghost to fall, we want people to confess their sins, to repent of all of their, their problems and faults, and we want people to be filled with the Holy Ghost, to walk in the gifts of the Spirit, to walk in holiness and righteousness. There's not a whole lot of uh, uh, apostolics in these last days. There's not a whole lot. And I'll tell you this, there's not a whole lot of apostolics that are strong about what they believe, and they practice charity and kindness. Amen. Go to an apostolic church. <laughs> See how well you're treated. <laughs> you're going to hear good word, but sometimes you're not going to be treated the best. That's why we have to be a light. We have to have the charity of God. We have to be perfected in our lives to be an example. Hey, we believe in strong doctrine, but we can have strong kindness as well. Can somebody say amen? amen. 
Romans 10 and 15 says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. A preacher must be sent, and he is only sent by God. He is only sent by God. So from the birth of the church to its maturity, the church of Jesus Christ will be apostolic. Morningstar, let me encourage you this evening to remember that we build our life on prayer, that His Spirit is in us. We need to pray in the Spirit, pray in tongues. We need to desire spiritual gifts. We need to desire to operate in the gifts. Uh, uh, there's so much more that God has in store for us, but sometimes we limit God because of our distractions. We limit God because we don't pray very much or we don't break through or we're just not sensitive enough to God. But I, I, I'm encouraging you, help Morningstar, help the ministry, help this community by, by being more apostolic. Jesus, I, I want to walk in the spirit like never before. I, I want to have a stronger conviction than I've ever had to, to just do the will of my father. To proclaim the name, to tell people to come to the house of God to repent of their sins, tell people, hey, guess what? You need to have your sins washed in, in the name of Jesus through baptism. And, and there's going to be a massive transformation in your life. You know, I, I love one of, the, one of the best ways of, of explaining the gospel or baptism is, is just saying this. We can go through all the theology from the Old Testament to the New Testament, but how about you just get baptized in Jesus' name, surrender your life to him, and see what happens. You will notice that there's a very big change in your life. Because something happens in the water. The blood starts to cleanse you. The water washes you. His spirit is there to fill you, to change your life. I, I don't, can't tell you countless of, of people in this place that have been bound by substance abuse. And the moment that they were baptized, boom, it was gone. Just, just strong addictions have been gone. And, and then there are times when we're baptized and, and we're walking with the Lord and there are certain things that are still there bothering us. But yet, in time, if you just hold on, he's going to give you the strength to overcome whatever the devil puts before you, whatever temptation, whatever challenge. God will give you the strength because he's given you that same apostolic authority that he gave them in the book of Acts. He has given it to you, and we have enough faith to believe it and say, you know what, we're not going to push this off in, you know, to some other century, but we're going to believe this for ourselves. We are apostolic. We have authority. We have the name of Jesus, and, and we're going to stand upon that. And this isn't just a denomination for you know, organizational sake, but this is what we believe because this is what Jesus handed down to the 12 apostles, and we are the recipients of that, and we get to walk in the blessed love, mercy, grace, apostolic authority that he has designated for the church of the living God. Why don't you give him a clap offering, thanking him for his goodness. If you would stand with me. I'm praying that as we move forward closer to the Lord's return, that there would be more of a dedication of prayer and really seeking the things of the Spirit. Because as you corporately get together and, you know, come before service, we have 15 minutes of prayer to, to kind of un unload your burdens from the day, from the week, to come and to prepare your heart for an awesome worship service. This Sunday, I, I pray that you would come and give yourself some time to pray and say, Lord, I, I need a new touch from the Holy Ghost. I need a, I, I need a change. I need, I, I need to stir up that gift that is inside of me. And, and, and I know that there are so many gifts that God's placed in you and abilities and uh, uh, work and, and things that, that are needed in this last day. But it's not going to happen unless you are sensitive to the Lord and you open yourself up to the Spirit and say, God, just deal with me. Speak to me. Help me. God may give you a word that helps you. God may give you a word for somebody else. But let the Lord move upon you. Remember, you are apostolic. Amen. Why don't we thank him for his goodness.
There's so much more to apostolic doctrine than just what was talked today about, but I just felt led to talk about uh, those core issues, and I'm praying that um, we do love denominations. It just ha doesn't happen to be for us to be in one right now, but the Lord has allowed us to be uh, independent of an organization, but we're we're a part of the organism, which is the church of the living God. We bear his name and we bear his spirit. And we're so thankful for that.